Hello, everyone. It's my greatest uh, it's my greatest pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dylan Small from Wharton School. And Dylan currently is a university furniture professor and also the department chair of the Department of Statistics and Data Science at the Wharton School. And Dr. Small received his PhD from Stanford University at 2002, uh, 2002 working with Zhang Li and working, and then he since then he joined Wharton School and has published more than 200 papers and all oh, many of these papers are very exciting if you do causal inference you must have seen of several of his work it's just so much fundamental and very exciting and he also received numerous awards from nsf and nih and he has done tons of work in this fund trying to understand how causal inference can be applied to you know solving a real problem in social sciences and medical research and a lot of scenario and today he's going to present of uh, his present to us a lot of very exciting topics so Dylan, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Yanchi, for that kind introduction. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to be talking today about um, work on testing elaborate theory um, in an observational study, and this is joint work with uh, Bikram Karmakar. Who's, I'm assistant professor at the University of Florida. Um, so um, uh, observational studies have had some big successes and failures. Uh, but, you know, the most famous success when teaching textbooks is the, the evidence for smoking uh, um, causing uh, lung cancer that comes came um, all from observational studies. There were no randomized trials. Uh, another one is um, fetal alcohol syndrome. I mean. It used to be that the doctors actually prescribed alcohol to pregnant women to relax them. Um, and it was only it was through observational studies that it was discovered that, um, that um, drinking can cause um, fetal alcohol syndrome in, in, in the child. Um, but there've also been some big failures. Um, so probably the most, one of the most famous ones is hormone replacement therapy for postmenopausal women and heart disease. So there have been a bunch of observational studies which had um, suggested that hormone replacement therapy would prevent heart disease, and it was given to many, many, many women um, after menopause. Uh, and then there was a randomized trial done, and actually the opposite, that hormone replacement therapy caused heart disease. Um, another one is there's, there's a lot of observational studies to show that people who eat more vitamins uh, live longer. But all of the randomized trials have not shown that. They've shown if any, the vitamins themselves don't seem to be to be effective, and if anything, they can increase mortality from overuse. So, um, it says uh, this cartoon kind of gets at you know some of the uh, concerns people have about observational studies. That, like so, here it's kind of like you read on the news, you know, it's like a random thing. Coffee can cause depression in twins, and then the next day you read, okay, coffee can't cause. Uh, depression in rats or you know, in children. And it seems like the findings are reversed. It seems to, there's a lot of stuff that seems to go back and forth um, depending on what day you're reading the news. Um, so a big question, you know, from the statistical perspective and thinking about observational studies, you know, the methods of observational studies is are, are, there, are there things that we as statisticians can do to try to avoid some mistaken causal inferences from observational studies. Um, so this, um, so w William Cochrane kind of, you know, founded the statistical theory of observational studies, um, and he, in, in his sort of seminal paper, he, he talked about um, something that actually Fisher told, said that you know, when, when asked in a meeting what can be done in observational studies to clarify the step from association to causation, Sir Ronald Fisher replied, make your theories elaborate. The, the reply, so Cochrane continued, the reply puzzled me at first since by Occam's razor, the advice usually given is to make theories as simple as is consistent with the known data. What Sir Ronald meant as the subsequent discussion showed was that when constructing a causal hypothesis, one should envisage as many different consequences of its truth as possible and plan observational studies to discover whether each of these consequences is found to hold. This multiphasic attack is one of the most potent weapons in observational studies. So, so let me uh, give, give an example of an elaborate theory. 
Uh, so this relates to kind of the question about does a parent or lead exposure on the job put a child at risk for lead exposure? So just some background. So like this from uh, in, in April, 1933, uh, this woman, Ann White Matthews, she wrote to Frances Perkins, uh, who was the first woman member of a cabinet. Who said, she said, I wish to congratulate you on your appointment as secretary of labor. I believe a woman has higher ideas and ideals than a man, also a greater concern for human welfare. I'd like to tell you about my baby Martha. She will be three years old, July 29th. She cannot walk, talk, sit up, or even hold up her own head. Uh, Mrs. Matthews' husband, Frank, was a chemist at Griselli Chemical Company, making arsenic of lead and other lead compounds. When Martha was a year and a half, Frank, her husband, Frank, had developed a severe case of lead poison. Uh, and, uh, Mar Mar Martha's doctor found Martha had high lead in her blood and believed Martha's condition was due to Frank's exposure to lead on his job, calling Martha industry's child. Uh, Mrs. Matthews continued, Please, Mrs. Perkins, I'm not a lobbyist. I'm a mother who has seen her own, her husband's, and her life, child's life practically wrecked by industry. I want drastic legislation protecting a lead worker and his family. Um, the company, Griselli Company, chemical companies argued that any lead exposure in, in Frank and Martha was likely due to other sources and refused to install any protective devices or compensate the Matthews family. Um, so then, um, you know, a while later, uh, Morton et al. did this observational study trying to look at um, whether uh, parents who worked in a battery factory uh, who were exposed to lead, whether that led to, whether that caused higher lead in, in, in their children. Um, and so they did a, it's a match study. They paired each treated child, a controlled child from a different household whose age differed by most one year they live close by in the same neighborhoods that they were exposed to the same neighborhood exposures of lead. Um, and in it, they also collected some additional information on how much of lead a parent who works in the battery factory is exposed to. So that they say have a dose, high, medium, or low, depending on where in the battery factory they work. They also collected information on the hygiene of the worker. So um, they said the hygiene is good if the uh, work or shower, shampoo, and change clothes at work, clothes at work. Uh, moderate if they um, change in clothes at work um, without uh, showering and poor if they had none of these practices. Um, so an, an elaborate theory would say, you know, how does, so if we, if, if so in, in, in the actual study, it, it's, it was always, it was just men who were working at the battery factory. So it's, it's a father. So if, if, if father's exposure to lead has an effect on the lead, then so think about a laboratory, think thinking about, you know, what are the different consequences? So that, you know, the most basic thing is we'd expect higher lead levels in treated children than match controls. You know, treated, treated children, children whose father worked in the battery factory. Um, additionally, we'd expect that if the father was exposed to more lead in the battery factory, that they'd have a child with more lead than if the child was exposed to lower lead. And additionally, you know, with the hygiene, we expect among those fathers who are exposed to high lead, the, the ones, the children whose um, father has poor occupational hygiene should have higher um, lead than the, those who have good hygiene. Uh, so so um, why would sort of, if, if we could confirm these three things, why would that be better than just, why would we have more evidence for lead being, the father being exposed to lead causing a child to have more lead? Why would we have more evidence that if we just done the, just just the comparison of the, the treated children and match controls? So I mean the the the, the, the treated children just the match controls. Okay, that well that could potentially be biased if the battery factory parents have hobbies that expose them more to lead. So for example, shooting firearms during target practice or car painting. Um, now the comparison of the the children whose father worked in the high lead part of the factory, the low lead factory. That could also be biased if the, the fathers who work in the high lead have these more lead exposing hobbies like shooting firearm during target practice and car painting. But it's a different bias than the first bias. So the first bias is comparing, you know, uh, ones who work in the battery factory to ones who didn't. The second one is, is ones who work in the high battery factory, high exposure part of the battery factory, the low exposure part of the battery factory. And then the third comparison 
uh, the treated children whose father has poor occupational hygiene compared to good hygiene. Well, that could also be biased if the, the poor hygiene workers um, have hobbies that expose them more to lead than the good hygiene workers. But again, it's, it's a different bias. It's, it's talking about different people. Um, so now, it, it, so if all three aspects of the elaborate theory hold, then in order for there to be no effect of um, the father being exposed to lead on the child, there have to be these three different sort of separate biases that we're, we're operating. Um, so, so in thinking about kind of um, how to uh, develop scientific knowledge um, and, and using these elaborate theories, so the, the philosopher Susan Hack, she, she compared it to a, a crossword. She said, the model of developing scientific knowledge is not how one determines the soundness or otherwise of a mathematical proof, it is rather how one determines the reasonableness or otherwise of entries in a crossword puzzle. And Paul Rosenbaum uh, brought uh, Susan Hack's ideas into um, statistics. So, so here's the, the analogy. So, um, so if you think about, um, uh, okay, so here's a crossword. And so think about it, if you're like 16 across, that's German wheels, okay. So the actual answer that works for the crossword is, is Audi. It's a you know, German type of car. But it could have also been Opel. That's another type of German uh, car manufacturer. Um, so, so it's kind of, so the point is the crossword clues themselves don't necessarily identify the answer. Just like comparing tree to the control, it could be biased and just that one comparison doesn't identify the answer. Um, so like if you look at one across, it's desert storm missile. So one possibility would be SCUD, right? The, the SCUD missiles that were used in the Persian Gulf War. Um, so, okay, now, I mean, we, we know that could be wrong, just as Opal would have been wrong for, for 16 across. Now, now then we look for, we'll say one down, cry noisily. Now I'm sort of seeing this as we think, you know, maybe sob, it's, it could be reasonable. Okay, um, uh, four down is um, hound. So, you know, seeing this, you might think of a dog as a hound, um, but it could also have been the activity of hounding somebody. So it, it, it could be a different answer. Um, now 17 across, so, so let's say this is sob and this is dog, and you have this B and this G. So 17 across, you look at optimistic viewpoint to look on, you know, this B and this G, you might think of bright side. Um, okay, so no, we can't be sure any of these answers are, are right, but that the fact that we have more confidence in SCUD because we, we have, you know, it, it sort of met sob and dog and those seem like reasonable answers and then they met bright side. Um, no, but the, the this so 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 these answers are all sort of coherent with each other, but the coherence sort of lacks uh, it, it lacks um, sharp borders. For example, bright side does not intersect scud, but it's it still strengthens scud because it strengthens sob and dog, and so and those strengthen scud. Um, and so the the reasoning and sort of this thing of the crossword is it's circular but not visually circular. So part of the evidence for scud comes from its meeting with sob. Part of the evidence for Saab comes from his meeting with Scud, but but on the other hand, the evidence may be demarcated. We may be asked the ask the aspects of the evidence are not circular. So when thinking about the evidence we have for Saab, we can set aside its appropriate meaning with Scud and ask: Is there any other evidence? So it's other evidence that meets with bright side. So we never get we're never sure. Um, and in fact, there was a there was a crossword done for the 2016 election that somehow. Um, had, um, uh, I think it was the, the answer, one of the, one of the answers, um, one of the clues it, um, had, you know, who, who the first name of the next president, it could, and um, it was done, it was, the, it was the, done the day before the 2016 election. It said Donald and Hillary, um, and there were way, the rest of the crossword could be, could be filled out so that it was consistent with either the answer Donald or Hillary. So. So there were two ways to fill out the crossword. Um, so you never know for sure that your answers are right, but the more answers that, that cohere and, and are consistent with each other, the more confidence you have. So it's the same thing kind of with the elaborate theory. The more things, the more separate comparisons you do, 
you know, tests of the theory and they're, they're separate, um, the more they point in the same direction, the more confident you are. Um, so, so let's look, go back to the, the, the lead example. So we had three parts of our lab theory. The first was comparing uh, treated to control. Um, and so the, these are the blood lead level and box plots. So first of all, the blood level levels were a lot. So this study was done in like the late seventies. They're a lot higher than today. Uh, so today, you know, the CDC says they're worried about a lead level of five micrograms per deciliter. You know, even the controls are, are out at, you know, median of, of, of about over 15. Um, uh, and that's been, one reason is there was there was lead in gasoline at the time. So that was a major source of lead. Um, but it does look like the treated are higher than the control. Now here's the comparison about where the, the where they work in the battery factor, the high lead, the medium lead, and the low lead part. Um, so again, it does look like there's a pattern of more and high, medium, low, but it's not clear it's significant. This this comparison isn't very different. Here's the comparison with a hygiene. Uh, so it looks like, so your poor and moderate seem to be about the same. Good is is somewhat lower. So, so in, in the actual paper, the, the Morton et al. carried out many tests of aspects of their elaborate theory. Um, the, the majority of tests had um, significant p-values, but but not all. Um, for for example, the um, the medium lead exposure group was not significantly different from the low exposure group. So these weren't, these, these, this comparison wasn't significantly different. Um, so they, they sort of said, you know, the majority of these tests are supportive of the theory and they concluded that, that their study provided additional confirmation that increased risk of lead absorption occurs in children and employees in a lead related industry. Um, so, I mean, an important question is, you know, how, how do we, how do we, um, how do we check the degree of uh, you know, how, how do we statistically assess the how, how the corroboration of the elaborate theory? Co Cochran mentioned this is an important question. Um, so, okay, so and, and so what the Morton et al. paper did and it's often done is they just kind of look at the fraction of tests the prediction that were significant. Um, so some problems with that are. Well, first of all, if the tests are not independent, it's hard to interpret. So if you just do like five very correlated tests, then it's not very meaningful at all. I mean, to say that one test was significant and five tests are significant, you're not actually gaining that much extra information if five tests are significant. They're all very highly correlated. Um, also, just counting the fraction of p-values are significant, it, it may miss, um, quantitative patterns. So for example, if you have two independent p-values that were both 0.09, well together, that's kind of strong evidence that there's some effect. Like if you do Fisher's combination test, when you multiply together p-value, that would be significant. Um, and then third, it just doesn't, it doesn't account for any unmet, the possibility of any unmeasuring found. There's no sensitivity to unmeasuring confounding in an observational study. Sensitivity to unmeasured confounding is, is very important. So, uh, so, so in our work, we're trying to address these these three uh, problems. Okay. So, so first of all, let me say a little bit more about why it's a value of independent tests. So, because fi finding a second test confirms the result of a first test, it doesn't provide much new information if if the tests are highly correlated. So, for example, um, if you have um, um, so, so here, let's say you have here you have an, you have a, an effect size of a half. Okay, and let's say you have fifty pairs, and let's say you do the the uh, t test and Wilcox and sign rank test. You see the p values are highly correlated to the test. So, in other words, if I tell you a t test is, is is significant, and then I tell you the Wilcox and sign rank test is significant, you haven't really learned a lot of new information. It's nice to know that the results are robust and. and the Wilcox and sign rank is also significant, but it, it's, it's no big surprise. Um, and so uh, the philosopher Wittgenstein remarked about the man who bought several copies of the morning paper to assure himself that what it said was true. So the, of course, you know, you know, buying a, a second copy of the same paper, well, it, 
if it says the same thing, at least you can verify there wasn't some kind of printing mistake. But you you don't you're not really learning much new from that second newspaper. So that's what we try to want to avoid that misunderstanding by not having highly correlated tests and ideally having independent tests. Um, so now, so, so you might be thinking, okay, now I've got one study, how am I gonna get two independent tests? So it, there, there's a large literature on this um, in statistics, um, but so let's just look at one very simple example. So suppose we were actually, we were actually able to do random assignment of three parents, to, uh, and the one would work in, in, in not a battery factory. One would work in a battery factory in the low exposure lead job, and one would work in the battery factory in the high exposure lead job. Um, and you uh, define uh, the rank uh, to. So first of all, let's go. Rank A is going to be take the the child that was assigned to the control and rank their, their, their lead exposure. Then rank B is gonna be just ignore whoever was assigned to the control and just compare the person assigned to the battery factory, low exposure lead, the battery factory, high exposure lead. And then, um, uh, and then look at the rank and the lead exposure of the one assigned to group B, the, the low exposure lead job. Um, so, under the null hypothesis of no treatment effect, these two sequential ranks, where they're computed from the same data, are, are independent. Uh, and proof is just that, so if you condition on whoever got assigned to the control among two remaining individuals, if you had random assignment, the higher ranked individual with higher lead exposure, if there's no effect of lead, is equally likely to be assigned to group B or C. Um, so the conditional distribution of rank B does not affect uh, rank A. So this is a special case of a theorem in probability Renyi's theorem. So we, we were able to construct uh, five independent, uh, I'm going to call effectively independent tests. So it's really, you, you, for the results I'm going to show, um, you don't actually need the test to be exactly independent. What you need to be, what you need is that if you treat them as independent, that that's conservative, that their p-values, the, the joint distribution of p-value is um, uh, stochastically dominates the uniform distribution. Uh, so that, that, that's going to ensure that when you treat them as independent, that, that that's conservative. Um, so, so we have these five effectively independent tests. So the first is just basically just comparing the treated children as father worked in a battery factory with the control children. And the second is among the treated children comparing high or median exposure uh, to, to the lead in the factory versus low. And then among the treated children comparing the medium exposure to the low. Um, and then among the high exposure treated children comparing the good or moderate hygiene versus four, but for poor hygiene. And then among the high exposure treated children comparing good versus moderate hygiene. Um, and so, um, so here are the p-values of, of these tests. So, so we see that, okay, so, so, so three of them are significant. Um, so, so now what we're gonna have is uh, uh, using partial conjunction testing to try to say what fraction of the, so now we have these independent tests and what fraction of them are, are the nulls false. Um, so we can consider testing that, you know, at most zero, one, two, up to say, and test and, and null or false. Uh, so, so now suppose we want to test the hypothesis that a null is that R minus one less nulls or false. The alternative is greater than or equal to R, R nulls or false. Well, what, what Wong and Owen showed is that you can do all these tests. You can test them for zero, one, uh, and this is also Benjamin and Heller, both Benjamin and Wong and Owen showed. You can test them for, you know, zero nulls are false, one null is false, all the way up to n nulls are false. You can do all those tests simultaneously at the p-value p level 0.05. So you don't actually have to test correct from multiple corrections here because of the structure of the test. But, you, you know, for each test, um, 
you, you, these results are under an, um, when you use an admissible p-value combination test. So the, an example of an admissible combination test is the Fisher's combination test, which is just multiplying together the p-values. And then the null distribution of minus two times the log of the product has a chi-square distribution with two times the number of p-values, uh, degrees of freedom. Um, so in other words, you, you, you could, um, you, you, you could apply this test the, to the n minus, to, to test whether the n minus r plus one largest p values are significant. If they are, that'd be evidence to reject that null. Um, we, we actually, in observational studies, the, we use a variation of the Fisher's combination test that we found is a little more powerful um, in the context of observational studies. And that's to the truncated product is any p value that's above a set limit just gets truncated to one. So if, if your limit is say 0.9, your p-values are, p are 0.9 just get truncated up to one. And then you can find the, 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 the null distribution of this is a binomial mixture of gammas. So, 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 so by doing these, uh, these combination tests um, uh, and, and we can actually uh, control the family-wise error rate of 0.05. Uh, and if we have evidence that at least R of the n nulls are false, then we can test the n individual nulls and reject the p-values less than 0.05 over n minus R. So this is, we don't have to pay the full bond from a price. We just have to pay the price of the, um, the minimum number of nulls that could be true. So, so here are the results. Um, so here, here's the original p-value table. So let's say we want to test that at least three nulls are false. So now n, n is five here and r is three. So n minus r plus one is three. So we need to test all the individual nulls at 0.05 over three. There's a 0.05 over n minus r, which is 0.05 over um, uh, n minus r plus one. So n minus r plus one here is, um, Is, is 0.05 over n minus r. Oh, well, I mean, this, you, 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 sorry, n minus r plus one. Is, n minus r plus one is three here, and with these three p-values, so we test the individual nulls at level 0.05 over five minus three to 0.025, so we see they're all, all significant. Now, if you want to test that at least four nulls are false, so now n minus r plus one would become so that would be four. So five minus four plus one uh, uh, is three. So, you, so oh, sorry, um, n, uh, n minus r plus one, five minus four plus one is two. So you look at the two largest p-values, it's 0 0.1, 0 0.42. If you do Fisher's combination of tests on that, it's not significant. It gives a p-value of 0.18. Um, okay, so now, so, so far I've been talking about, you know, so we have evidence for how many how many nulls are false? Um, but so far, all those tests are assuming there's no hidden bias, no unmeasured confound. Um, you know, a major challenge in observational studies is that is that you know typically, you know, as much as we try to measure the, the confounders, there's typically unmeasured confounders. And it, there's there's two types of bias to worry about. One is just you know bias from measured confounders. So we can handle that, and we can. Control it by stratification, matching, regression, um, you know, all, all kinds of uh, tools have been developed. Um, but the harder thing is to deal with hidden bias from unmeasured confounding. Um, so I like to, you know, this is a cartoon I show my class that is sort of, you know, the control group here is these very staid people and these out of control people are sort of going, going crazy. Uh, the point I take out of the cartoon is that, you know, he, there's some reason oftentimes why people are in the tree in a control group. And, and so there, there's oftentimes unmeasured variables that explain that. Okay, so if, if there is, um, if there are unmeasured um, confounders, um, we, we can do a, um, one way to, to worry, you know, address concerns about unmeasured confounders is to do a sensitivity analysis to unmeasured confounding. And what I'll talk about here today is, is uh, Paul Rosenbaum's gamma method. So the, the, the gamma parameter, it, it takes between two people the same measured covariates. 
um, that gamma, it's the maximum odds ratio that one gets treated rather than the other because of unmeasured con confounders. So if, if there were no unmeasured confounders, gamma would be just one. Um, if there were um, uh, unmeasured confounders that could uh, uh, double the odds of being treated, then gamma would be two. If there were unmeasured confounders that could triple the odds of being treated, gamma would be three. Uh, and for a whole bunch of tests, there's a way to find the maximum p-value given a gamma, and that's in Rosenbaum's 2002 observational studies book. So, so here's what it looks like in, in our study. Um, so, so these are for different gamma, for different comparisons. These are the, so these are the original p-values for gamma are the ones that we know are measured confound. Uh, so here is gamma 1.2. So this is an unmeasured confounder could increase the odds of being treated by 20%. So we still see that the that the, the these findings still seem to be significant. Uh, so, but it, it around um, um, I mean, here around gamma is 2.6. This comparison seems to be no longer significant, and it's more non-significant as gamma increases. So this study is sensitive to about gamma is 2.6. Um, just for comparison, uh, you know, some other studies, so, you know, the effect on smoking on lung cancer, we know that's kind of a huge effect. That was sensitive at gamma is five. So that means there would need to be an unmeasured confounder which quintuple the odds of smoking. It didn't seem like that. But like a study, there was a study of that coffee causes heart attack. It's very sensitive, but it showed an effect that coffee causes heart attacks, but the, but the study is very sensitive to bias. Uh, so, so we can do a sensitivity analysis of a partial conjunction test. And basically, basically what we show is that you, you, can, you can do the same thing. You can take the maximum p-values and then you can, comply, can apply the conjunction test. So, so here, um, at gamma is 1.4. So let's say we want to test that at least three nulls are false. Um, so you would take the, so n minus r plus one here would be, um, uh, um, uh, three um, would be two, right? So, so you, you, I mean, this is the um, r here, there's, um, Sorry, there's there's um, sorry five. So so n n n minus r um, uh, plus one is we look at the three largest p values. So we would look at um, this one, this one, and this one. If you apply Fisher's combination test, that's not significant. Um, so the results are somewhat sensitive to bias. Um, but but the support but the results are supportive of the elaborate up to some moderate bias. So we, we still have evidence for uh, yeah, at least three nulls are false, even with a bias of gamma is 1.4. So yeah, so um, so that kind of wraps up this example where we see that you know, we we basically found that um, we got some confirmation for the elaborate theory. It was it was uh, significant, and, and we, we even have evidence for at least at least three of the five nulls being false up to gamma is 1.4 bias. Um, and now, um, last topic I'm gonna to talk about is, is a different example, in which we'll, we'll see you know, that, that um, actually the elaborate theory is sort of not, not confirmed. So, so the question here is if Catholic school, so the question, this is basically the question, of, you know, are Catholic schools better than high school, uh, public high schools? So of course, you know, it's important to take account of confounders because there, there are no you know, reasons why people attend Catholic school. Oftentimes, you know, it, it's students who the parents are worried about, you know, feel like really want to give a chance to child to get ahead. Um, and, and various variables are correlated with whether you go to a Catholic school. Um, so if you think about an elaborate theory, um, so the first comparison is just the most basic Catholic school students. Because sorry, the, the outcome here is going to be um, earnings when a person is about age 35. So the first ex expectation would be that Catholic students will earn more than public school students. That was where we started with the study. Then we thought, you know, what, what else, what are other consequences being true? Um, so another consequence is that uh, the, if, you're, if you're close to, a, if you live close to a Catholic school, you're more likely to go. 
um, so that, that those students living in Grimm more Catholic schools are more likely to go to a Catholic school and they'll earn more because they went to a Catholic school. And the third kind of thing, an implication of if you uh, assume that, that being Catholic does, going to public high school does, or be going to Catholic school does increase earnings. Um, um, so another, another kind of comparison you do is just compare Catholics to non-Catholics. Catholics are much more likely to go to Catholic school. So you expect them to earn more Catholics than, than non-practicing Catholics because they got the benefit of going uh, to, to the Catholic school. Uh, and, and each of these comparisons have been done in published papers, but they've never done it, been done in the same paper. Um, and, and sort of similar with a crossword. Each of these could be biased, but they'd be biased by different sources. Um, so, um, so, so let's look at this for this comparison, living near a Catholic school and, and earnings. So you know, there, there, there are two um, potential biases if you just if you try to use live near Catholic schools so earnings to, to infer what attending the Catholic school effect would be in earnings. Uh, the first kind of thing is that um, you, you need that, that living near a Catholic school it, it can't affect earnings except through its effect on attending a Catholic school. So this is one of the conditions of being an instrumental variable. The other condition is the exclusion restriction, which says that, um, that living near a Catholic school has no direct effect on, on earnings. It only affects the earnings through attending a Catholic school. So, so the, base, the first assumption is that living near a Catholic school is an instrumental variable. Um, so uh, we, we looked at that assumption. Um, okay, let me, so here's some facts about the study. So the outcome is earnings age 35. Um, for the geographic accessibility, we're just compare urban and rural because we don't have very fine geographic detail. But comparing urban students to rural students, 22% of the ur urban students attend Catholic schools uh, versus 6% of the rural students. Um, so geographic accessibility definitely affects going to Catholic school. Um, for the, the religion that, you know, Catholics are much more likely to go to Catholic schools than non-Catholics. So in urban areas, half of the students um, were Catholic and uh, a little less than half attended Catholic high school. For non-Catholics, none of them attended any Catholic high school. Um, now in rural areas where Catholics are in the minority, uh, only 17% attended Catholic high school, well, less, but that's a lot more than less than half a percent attended um, of non-Catholics that attended Catholic high school. So this would this is the argument for religion being instrumental variable for going to Catholic school. Now yeah so the the I mean the direct comparison we could do is just compare students attending Catholic high schools to students attending public high school, stratifying an urban rural and Catholic non-Catholic. Yeah this was um what got us motivated in the study is we thought about this comparison. We thought, you know, it may be biased because those parents who attend send their children to Catholic school were more motivated and that might might have helped um, earnings um, in a way that wasn't due to going to a Catholic high school. Um, so we did we did stratify on some measure confounders, IQ score, prior to high school, parents' education, parents' income, parents' occupational prestige. So we still did find that going um, to Catholic high school um, caused more earnings. Um, now, we, now we thought about, you know, how, how can we use this um, evidence, this um, elaborate theory framework to try to see how much of the, um, the elaborate theory that involves these three comparisons is confirmed. Now, uh, we show that these free analysis are effective, can be treated as, as independent since the, the, the joint p-value is uh, above the uniform distribution. Um, so now, um, so here are the results. Um, so, so gamma is one means no hidden bias. Uh, I guess we see the all three are significant, um, showing that Catholic, those attending Catholic school earn more. Uh, we see there's evidence at least one and at least two nulls for both. But here now, if you go up to just a little bit of bias, so this is gamma is 1.1 of the urban, maybe 10% of high, higher odds of, um, going to Catholic high school. Now this, this, 
this religion effect we saw before goes away, although the, and, and this is starting to go away, although this one is still significant. Um, so if you get up to gamma is one and a quarter, which means that the um, a measure compounder decrease your odds of going to Catholic school 25%. I mean, now we see there's no longer evidence that at least one null is false. So we can see that 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 you know the, the thing that's most driving any effect of Catholic high schools is urban versus rural comparison. So essentially, in, in this sort of instrumental variable picture, we think of you know we're treating urban as an instrumental variable. And so we, we need that urban has no direct effect on urban except through encouraging you to attend a Catholic school. And we need that urban is also independent of unmeasured variables. Now, so can, can we test that assumption? Well, consider the, the subset of non Catholics. Their link between urban and attend Catholic school is basically non existent because most of them don't attend Catholic school. So it's really it's, it's a very special case and nothing to do with urban rural. Um, now, if, 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 if this is true, then there should be no effect of urban rural on um, earnings among non Catholics. Because non-Catholics, um, uh, I mean, they 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 don't attend Catholic school. So any attack of Catholic school doesn't exist for for non-Catholics. So if there was an urban-rural difference, that would have to be uh, suggested. You know, it's, it's that, that actually urban-rural is related to um, non numbers or variables and earnings. So we, so we can test that. So we, among non-Catholics, the median wages were higher in urban areas. I mean, in 15,000 urban areas versus 13,000 rural areas. And this, is, this money is a lot less because this was you know, than today, the 70s. But, but this, this, this is very, this is concerning because basically we're depending on, you know, the, the results are highly dependent on this urban rural comparison. But this urban rural comparison looks like it might be biased. Uh, because actually, urban seems to be, be related to unmeasured variables. Uh, so, so this is somewhat concerning. So, um, in summary, um, if you always design your study to just compare treatment and control, that encourages you to, to get a result to say either the treatment caused the effect or, or it didn't cause an effect. But that it doesn't provide any way to suggest caution. So you, know, you should just be cautious about the study. And so that it's not a good design. And an easy way to publish false calls of inclusions is just to look for evidence or might is to decline to look for evidence that might reveal bias at present. You know, sometimes people don't want to test an elaborate theory because they say, oh, I, I, I don't want to find out that my study is biased. But if, if, you're, if your goal is to, is to publish true conclusions, then you should, you should want to know if your study is biased. And, and if, if your cause of inclusion holds firm when potential biases are considered, that strengthens the evidence. There's, quote from the philosopher Charles Peirce, we should trust rather to the multitude and variety of arguments than, than to the conclusiveness of anyone. Our reasoning should not form a chain, which is no stronger than its weakest link, but a cable whose fibers may be ever so slender, provided that they are sufficiently numerous and intimately connected. Um, so I, I think we've just, in this work, scratched a surface of ways to summarize the degree of corroboration of elaborate theory, and there's a lot more uh, you know, uh, work that can be done in this, in this direction. Um, and these are some of the slides. And, and I, I think Emma said that she um, put them in the chat. So hopefully uh, if you're, uh, and if you wanna yeah, down, download them, uh, you're welcome or, or just email me, I can send you a copy. Um, so I think that's all I've got. And hopefully we have some time for questions. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, Dylan. Uh, thanks for, for a very nice talk. Yes, I've just shared the slides again. Uh, in the chat, and I can also send them to anyone if they're interested after the talk. Uh, so let's thank Dylan first for the talk. Great. Uh, and now I'll open the floor for questions. So if anyone on Zoom wants to ask a question, you're very welcome. Please uh, raise your hand or just. Yes, maybe I saw it. Carlos had a question. Carlos. You're being called out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh, sorry, you 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 were applauding, Arsene. Yeah, I was, I was clapping. Sorry. Was... Okay. <laughs> 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 no, now, now I have to have sorry a question. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, so there is a student there. I will come up with a question after okay. this student. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so um, I was just a little curious. You talked about like the sequential rank um, test and how that formed a independent test. I was just curious if you could go into a little more detail about how that worked. I, I hadn't heard of that before and it sounded kind of interesting. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I mean, I guess a, a good reference is uh, Paul Rosen has a paper in statistical science um, about kind of something called like the general theory of evidence factors. And, and it, it discusses kind of like a, is I mean, at an abstract level, it can be related to some group theory and stuff. But, but the but but sort of um, let me just give some intuition. Um, um, so in like in our setting, um, um, so like these these commit so like. Consider like let's, let's say these two tests. Okay, so here you're comparing the tree to the control. Now here you're doing a test that's sort of like within the treated, um, you know, higher medium exposure versus low. So, you know, kind of because one is comparing the whole tree to the control, and then and then you're looking within the treated. That there, that's what sort of constructs gives you this independence. And then like here you're saying among the treated, you're comparing medium exposure. So here you're doing higher medium exposure, grouping higher medium exposure compared to low, and then you're looking within the higher medium exposure. So actually, this is a, this is a typo, actually. Sorry. This should be um, among the treated children, um, uh, high versus medium exposure or low, and then this is medium exposure versus low. And, and then, so at each step, do you just drop the, the the people like do you just not consider the control children after step one? Right, right, right. And I, I guess I'm just just a little bit. Does that like lose a lot of power somehow? Is it possible to also use the other branch in in some way? Um, right, it's a good question. I mean, I don't, I don't think you're really losing power because you're kind of just breaking it off into these independent pieces. Um, but there are there are other there are in this particular case, but I think there are other settings where where the only way to construct independent tests might require losing power. And, and so, you know, I think another topic to think about is, you know, how to if you can't construct independent tests, you know, you have to construct correlated tests, you know, how to do that. So at least they're sort of minimally correlated. As a follow-up question, though, in the like in the fifth uh, test that you have there, don't, aren't you necessarily making a comparison between smaller subsets of the data than you are in the first one? Uh, yes, right. No, that, that is definitely true. Yeah, I mean, I mean but I mean, the other, if, if you had two correlated tests, um, you know, they may be using the whole data, but they're but they're but, but the pieces of the overlap are not really um, sort of carrying full weight, so. Right. Right, I guess this, it's not that this is necessarily losing power over the correlated test approach, but doesn't the test you do for hypothesis five have less, uh, less power, at least from the standpoint of number of observations than the test for hypothesis one? Yes, yeah, that's a good. Um, Dylan, I have a, actually a, a clarified question. So, if you go to yes. the to the next slide, uh, now uh, the one with the sensitivity, <clears throat> uh, there is a there was a table uh, with the yeah. So here. <clears throat> Because here, uh, so the gamma means something different, right? So we, I guess we have a different gamma for each hypothesis because that's a different treatment in a sense. Yeah, right, right. No, that, that's a good point. So and, yeah, I mean, so in other words, yeah, the gamma for this is talking about 
is referring to um, um, you know how, how how much an unmeasured compounder could affect the treated versus control comparison. This is comparing how much an unmeasured compounder could could affect um, the uh, high the you know where in the battery factory you work. So and that yeah that is a good point. You know the kind of so when you combine them, I just combine. It, I mean, you it's, it's the maximum. Them. You take the maximum of the gammas when you go to the next table, I guess, where you combine. Um, well, what we're doing here is is just saying suppose gamma was the same across all five. Okay. Well, and, okay. and a gamma of one point two, it means that the bias is at most one point two. Are are all different? Uh, treatments right okay thank you all right we also have a question actually in the chat from shane um is there a correlation is there a correlation from the p-values that comes from using smaller subsets of data repeatedly of the data um right yeah actually not yeah i mean not the way they're constructed they are i said they're, 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 they're effectively independent. Yeah, I mean, even though you're using smaller subsets of the same data, you're sort of using different pieces in a way that makes them independent. And Armin here in the room has a question. Yeah, I don't know if I can be seen. I had a question about yeah. the mechanism for ordering the hypotheses. Mm -hmm. So I guess you're looking at the p-values, am I right? Like, and based on that, you're determining the order, but is it in some sense, and does it make sense to have kind of an ordered set of hypotheses ahead of time? And then um, I'm just a little bit unclear about the, how significant the order of these statistical tests are. If you could um, comment on that, that would be. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. So, for, yeah, yeah. I don't, I think the testing we're doing doesn't, 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 I mean, the, the disordering doesn't play any role in, in, in the test. Um, but yeah, I mean, that does, but you might, I mean, that, that is kind of a weakness of our approach potentially in that it doesn't, it doesn't prioritize, you know, you might think that some tests are more important than others and we don't, we don't but do I, anything I, to try to give more weight to one test versus another. That, that and maybe it's possible that like, some things cannot simultaneously occur, right? Or I mean, maybe there is more structure than. Um, yeah, that, that is possible. But yeah, I, I mean, I think in this setting, it's, yeah, they could all occur. But, I mean, in general, there's supposed to be sort of independent comparisons that could all occur. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, are there any questions from people on Zoom? I think in the room, we don't have any questions. Oh, no, we do. Yeah. <clears throat> I have a question. So the more precise or elaborate you make a hypothesis, does this um, often result in a smaller p-value or can I artificially drive down the p-value by making it more, more, adding more constraints on hypotheses? Or, or, um, or is that completely off? No, I think it could. I mean, well, I mean, right. I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah. The, the more, I mean, the more, the more you, the more precise, you know, the more you bring into the elaborate theory. I guess, you know, it, it is kind of consistent with, I guess, you know, like Popper's who just need, you know, the, you, you, you should be trying to take risks. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess if you. I guess in the example, you, 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 you have to use judgment, just not just artificially creating so many comparisons that makes it impossible for the data. To, but I mean, we are controlling for the multiple testing aspect, so I think I don't think you should. Are, yeah, I mean, just adding more tests won't lead to because because we're controlling multiple testing. Just adding more tests shouldn't make it more likely to reject. Right. Uh, I think now we don't have any more questions in the room. Uh, 
anyone has a short question on Zoom, uh, I think we still have a few minutes and otherwise. Uh, may I ask the questions? Sure, of course, yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah, this is really exciting work. So I'm just, so I think here we publish in the, you can you kind of put it, can do multiple tests and because the variables are categorical, so it's kind of easier to separate. So I'm wondering if in the case if variables are continuous. So I think in that case that we probably would maybe perhaps choose a threshold to argue, oh, this is higher then the numbers is like higher group versus lower. But if I kind of optimize that threshold, I think that if I can, you know, I can kind of, if some bad scientists or bad, bad statistician, statistician just purposely choose the threshold to kind of maximize the power, I don't, I think that could potentially lead to some bias, right? Yeah, right. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's really uh, the principal way to do this is your elaborate theory should be specified in advance of seeing the data. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, if you specify after the fact, then, um, then, then you confirm a theory that you've already kind of specified after the data, then that's not very meaningful. Right. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Great. Uh, so, okay, everyone, let's uh, thank Dylan for his wonderful talk once again. Uh, thank you for coming and giving a talk and answering all these questions. Really appreciate yeah. it, Dylan. Thanks uh, for me. Yeah, uh, really a pleasure. Okay, everyone. Uh, so I hope you all have a great weekend and we'll see you next week. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.